Hi, everyone. Hey, we're going to get started. But before we do, I need to read the fire exit announcement. So please note the locations of the surrounding emergency exits. Locate the nearest exit, nearest lit exit sign to you. In the event of a fire alarm or other emergency, please calmly exit to the public concourse. Emergency exit stairwells leading to the outside of this facility are located along the public concourse. For your safety in an emergency, please follow the direction of the public safety staff. Great. So hopefully you're all here for, uh, for this talk. <laughs> We're going to be talking about transforming a bank with a highly opinionated automated release pipeline. I was trying to win the prize for the longest title at the conference, so we'll see. It's Jerry still out. So who am I? I'm Reed, Reed Lebec. I work at RBC, which is a bank in Canada. I've been there for eight and a half years, and I've been on the cloud team for the last three, two and a half, three years, thereabouts. And in that time, I've written several microservice-based applications, and we have uh, we've started to try to roll that out to the rest of the organization and try to write some tools to help them do it. So what are we going to talk about today? So I want to kind of take you through, for those of you who haven't worked at a big organization, government or bank, uh, that sort of stuff, I want to talk to you through kind of how we've, we've done it in the past, some ways we tried to fix that, and then kind of the problems that led to and how we solved those. So uh, hopefully everyone knows what a monolith is, a big giant thing that's unruly. Um, so that's not really the interesting bit, but more what comes out of, of having monoliths. So we end up having these long development cycles, so typically waterfall, uh, three months, if you're lucky, you'll get a deployment out. And uh, each application deployment is a special snowflake. So we need to work with every other team. You know, you need to work with the network team, the database team, the five app teams that also use your database, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's a mess. <laughs> so we don't really want to be doing that anymore. And the other thing to note is that we do a lot of ETL. So a lot of the bank's applications revolve around these three steps. You know, get data from somewhere, transform it into the right format, and then put it somewhere else. And so traditionally that's been done you know, with some database and then some process and then another database. So our idea at the bank was to stop doing that, which I thought was a good one, and we were going to do some event-driven architecture. So event-driven is a new hotness. Uh, the idea is that you take your data and turn it into events, and then you can write event processors instead of having batch jobs. So streaming is ultimately better than batch because you can always express a batch process as a stream. Reading a file in is just streaming the file, right? So we chose Kafka as our bus event stream, and we wanted to put uh, the data into Elasticsearch. So we have a lot of use cases where there's search use cases. So someone calls up the help desk, so, hey, can you help me here? And we need to look up the user's information. So Elasticsearch is perfect for that. And then we didn't want to do microservices. Uh, sorry, we didn't want to do monoliths, so we decided to do microservices, put a REST API in the front, and then the data is exposed to the rest of the bank, so we don't need to go through this mess all over again. So just briefly through the application architecture. And so the reason I want to focus on this is what we've done is we've written an APA framework for this type of architecture. So we didn't write a framework for every application at the bank. We wrote a framework for event-driven applications using Kafka and some sort of data store. In this case, it's Elasticsearch. So the data comes from somewhere, goes into Kafka. We have some consumer, which will do some sort of transformation. Um, put it in the bespoke format that we need for answering the question. And that question will be answered by the REST API, which will ultimately just ask Elasticsearch. And then the client will connect to the REST API. So fairly, uh, fairly simple architecture. Um, so we should be able to do something to make that pretty easy for everyone. <laughs> so we went from monoliths to microservices, and now we have a whole new set of problems. So all the processes at the bank are set up to deploy very infrequently. So when you do a deployment every three months, it's really hard. So you want to be really careful, and you want to be super diligent. You've got to coordinate everyone. So there's all kinds of processes about change records and getting everyone coordinated. But if you want to release you know, once an hour, once a day, once a week, that becomes quite onerous, and you spend more time doing the process than you do doing the, um, doing the actual deployment. 
And so the things that they want to make sure that, that, that are done in the process aren't necessarily bad things, like you know, making sure testing's done, um, making sure that you're not going to break stuff, you know, regression testing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the idea is we want to automate those checks. We don't want them to be some, some manual process. The other thing is as we get more microservices, things get hairy in a hurry. So if all our operations is set up around monitoring one application, then we're going to be in for a world of hurt when messages are uh, in Kafka and we have some eventual consistency in our API. So things get a lot harder. And the other bit is that every team has to do this themselves. So every team has to set up monitoring. Every team has to set up uh, a pipeline to go to production. Every team has to, has to figure out how to solve all these problems. And, and that sucks. So we need a pipeline. We need something that everyone can just use and, and benefit from. So there are too many pieces to do it ad hoc. You can't, you know, before you could get away with some, some person typing on a keyboard, and it'd be all right. But now, if you have you know, even five microservices, you're just going to be typing forever. We want something repeatable, and we want some way to automate all those processes away. So what do we want to automate? We want to automate testing, deployments, rollbacks. Ideally, we do some zero downtime deploys. Um, and those are not necessarily trivial. So it'd be nice if everyone didn't have to do it all themselves. All right. So the first time we tackled this was for an application. So we were uh, on the cloud team. I'm part of the cloud team. And we were kind of doing the first of these event-driven architectures. And so we had a very tight deadline. It was about uh, two months, two or three months, which is fairly tight when you have nothing going on. And it's incredibly tight when you work at a bank and um, everything has a three-day SLA to get access to anything. So what do we have? We had Cloud Foundry. So we had Cloud Foundry and we had our code in GitHub. And somehow we needed to get it from one to the other. So there was nothing. We had nothing there before. There's no pipeline we could leverage. We had a few tools, though. So we have Jenkins. We have a central Jenkins. So we, uh, we opted for Maven because we knew Maven. Um, no other reason than that. And, and the Jenkins was already up and running, so we didn't really need to set up our own. So that was a, a small win. Uh, we had this other tool called Urban Code Deploy. So quick show of hands, who's ever heard of that before? Wow, that's way more than I thought. OK, so for those of you who haven't, Urban Code Deploy is a IBM tool um, that lets you draw pretty pictures. And then those pretty pictures uh, will somehow deploy your application. <laughs> So it had a few nice features to it. So one, it was bank approved. So we didn't have to go through the process of figuring out, you know, how do we get whatever tool we're going to use approved? We can just go ahead and use this one. And for, um, for those who've worked at big organizations, they'll know that that's a non-trivial task. The other thing is it let us store secrets. So it was, it was a place that was approved to store usernames, passwords, et cetera. So if we need to connect to databases or Kafka, then, uh, then that's good. The bad part is that we couldn't store our config in source control, so in our case, Git, uh, which is bad, because anytime you make a change, you, you make a change to the code, and then if you need to update the pipeline, because we're still fairly new, then you have to go into this UI and make the change. And that's bad, because as your code changes, um, this doesn't really change with it. So you end up with a situation where one branch needs a change to the pipeline, and then master doesn't, and you can only deploy one of the two. So that was no good. And, and it only had a UI, and I don't really like using UIs for development. Um, it's just not my thing. So we decided to use Ansible. So who here has ever used Ansible before? Okay, who here has used Ansible to deploy the cloud? Yeah, so, so OK, we'll get to that. Um, Ansible was, was good. We knew, we knew Ansible. So that was kind of, we wanted to leverage some of the things that we knew. We had a tight deadline. We wanted to go ahead and not re reinvent everything. We could store the config in Git. That's good. We can move along with the branches. And we can have different config per environment. So Ansible has a concept of group vars, and you can have you know, a dev config and a prod config, which is good, because you're going to have different servers for Kafka, Elasticsearch, et cetera. Um, BAD, Ansible um, is really good at deploying. Say you want to install Tomcat on 10 servers, and you just kind of list the servers, and the way it goes, that's great. Um, deploying to Cloud Foundry, it's not so great. So there's no plugins for it. Uh, so we had to write a bunch of that ourselves, which was in scripts, like Python scripts, I think it was. Um, so that was, it was a bit, a bit uh, awkward. We also wanted to achieve idempotency. So the idea behind Ansible is if, say, Tomcat's already installed on, on server A, then it doesn't do anything. Right? So we wanted to get the same idea from, 
from that for Cloud Foundry. And so part of that was driven by the reason that we used monorepos, or a monorepo, I should say. So all our, all our microservices were in one, one repo. And we can talk about whether that's good or bad, um, but it was both good and, bad, good and bad in this case. So because we, every time something changed, it was gonna rebuild and redeploy everything, we wanted to make sure that it only redeployed what actually changed. And so we did some fun, and by fun I mean terrible ideas that you should never do at home. We decided to use MD5 sums to compare whether things had changed. So we, we, we took the MD5 sum of the jar we're deploying, so it's great, so we got that, and it was stored in, in an environment variable in Cloud Foundry, and we can just compare the next time, right? So the problem is, um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but jars in their headers have a timestamp or something that changes every time you build it. So even if you build the same, if you zip up the same files twice, uh, you'll get a different MD5 sum. So it's like, okay, well, we can work around that. So we expanded the jar into files, and then we did an MD5 sum of each of the files and put that in a, in a text file, and then we did an MD5 sum of that text file. So it got complicated real quickly. Um, but it did serve the purpose of we only redeployed what actually changed. Uh, the other tricky bit was services. So we have a few user-provided services to point to Kafka, Elasticsearch, any other services we need. And it's very easy to update a user-provided service. I mean, it doesn't really need to be idempotent. The only problem is that if you're not deploying the application that the service is bound to, then you need to restage that application. So we had to do some finagling to figure out which applications were bound to the service that changed. Um, so it got, it got way too complicated way too quickly. So we then had a second application, and it was very similar to the first, um, very similar event-driven architecture. We also had a tight, tight deadline because um, we did such a good job on the first one that they figured we could do an even better job on the second one, seeing as we solved all the hard problems. So there were still a few problems that we wanted to solve. Uh, we we're going we were gonna to use the existing pipeline because we didn't really have time to rewrite it, but we wanted things to go a bit faster. So I think, uh, I think for the first application, we had five or 10, somewhere, somewhere in that range, microservices. So deploying that every time gets, gets real slow. So what we wanted to do is, is deploy all of those at the same time, because there's nothing really dependent between the applications. They could, we could do five CF pushes at the same time. And all of this, again, is driven by the fact that we had a, a mono repo. So we added some parallelism. So our first attempt was to have urban code deploy call Ansible say five times with different parameters, say deploy application A, application B, application C. So then we broke the cardinal rule of, of put nothing in urban code deploy because then anytime something changed, we had to go back to, to this UI-based system which wasn't in Git, so that was no good. So what we did then is we added bash in front, so you know you're in trouble when you're doing parallelism in bash. <laughs> so, so we had a bunch of execs and weights in bash, and eventually we achieved some parallelism. So it was great. The other thing we really wanted to do was to do that automated testing bit. So the first one was a UI, the first application was a UI, and it, um, it just didn't have time to automate. Automating UI testing is, is difficult. Uh, so this one was all kind of just back end stuff, so we could easily send some data in the front and check that it made it at the end in the right way. So the problem we had though with automated testing was that we ended up running on a live instance. So we, we would deploy the application and because everything was so entangled, we had to have all the services up. And then we ran testing on that. And so that's okay, but if you find a problem, um, it's kind of too late, so you have to roll everything back and it takes time. So, so, so this, this was definitely a lot better, but we needed to uh, work on a few things. So what were our shortcomings? Well, it took too long. Um, the whole thing took about 20 minutes, even if you didn't change anything, but more often than not, you'd change some central library and you'd have to redeploy the whole thing. And so then we had a team, I think five or seven developers, and if we all wanted to do something, kind of, we all wanted to do work, right? And so every time we'd, we'd go to deploy, it, we'd have to wait 20 minutes. And on top of that, our automated testing was a bit flaky, so it's like we weren't sure if it had just timed out or if, we, if it was an actual failure. So we'd end up rewriting it. So we were lucky if we got kind of, four or five pull requests done in a day. Um, so it was really slowing us down. The other bit is we, if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, we picked a few of the wrong tools. So Ansible wasn't necessarily the right tool for deploying to the cloud. Um, Bash is fine, but not necessarily that robust. And urban code deploy wasn't really getting us too much. And there were, on top of that, there were still a ton of manual steps. 
So if we, if we want a new Kafka topic, or we want a new Elasticsearch index, or we want a new Cloud Foundry space, it was all manual stuff. We'd have to do that manually. So if I wanted to deploy to my own particular space, I would have to set up the whole pipeline, set up all the pieces myself. So welcome to the third and ultimate pipeline. So this time we had a bit, we had a bit more time, so we decided to rewrite from scratch. Um, so we threw away the code, but we kept all the lessons we learned. And we still had a few things, so we had GitHub still, that, that worked well, and we had Cloud Foundry, we wanted to keep that. And we wanted to keep Maven, so we like Maven, we know Maven, um, so we kept that one. Now one of the things we wanted to do, and, and you'll hear a lot about other people talk about pipelines, and they'll focus a lot just on the deployment side. And that's great, um, that's great that you can, you know, it certainly solves one part of the problem, but we want to go a bit further. We want to provide, not necessarily lock people in, but, but give them a head, out, head start on building their code as well. So when, when, we're doing, uh, when we're doing these applications, they're fairly standard, so everyone's gonna have more or less the same spring dependencies. You know, you'll depend on Elasticsearch, web, Kafka, et cetera. So we can at least fix the versions. So we have a bunch of, bunch of defaults that we have in the CI space. So we have a, a default parent palm, so you can just inherit from that, which is great. Um, and we have some Maven jobs, or sorry, some Jenkins jobs, which will scan your repo and just grab your, your Jenkins file. And it's like, okay, well that's kind of pretty standard, right? But then what we did is we wrote some functions which we added into our Jenkins, so you could just call those from your Jenkins file. So you just say, you know, do the CI, or do the CD. And, and then you wouldn't have to worry about all the steps, so like stuff, and we'll get to what they are, but stuff that are not necessarily straightforward. So we had Jenkins. Um, we decided to do our scripting in Python. We, uh, we have some experience in Python. It has a uh, fairly good REST API, uh, fairly good to call REST API, which we're gonna use for Cloud Foundry. We can run stuff on the shell as well, so it's good. And the other thing we, we used is Docker. And this is so key. Um, so, so we ended up running Jenkins on Docker and then the, the jobs would run inside Docker containers on Jenkins. And so that's super important because now we don't need to worry about, like, is CF CLI installed? Do we have the right version of Python? Oh, we need to scale out to another node. Are we gonna, what's our procedure to set everything up? And, and I know it sounds like, you know, we could give this talk five years ago, but, um, but it's pretty revolutionary for, for RBC to, to run this stuff on Docker, and it really helped us tremendously because once we had those those base Docker images with those, those um, prereqs in, we could just reuse those over, over and over again, which is great. And the other thing we decided to do was go multi-repo. So we didn't like the way that monorepo was working out for us. And I know some companies have made that work tremendously well, like Google and Facebook. But if you look at how they've done it, they end up using a lot of custom tools. And I know that Concourse, um, which we're at a Cloud Foundry Summit, so we might as well mention Concourse. Concourse does, very well where you'll, you'll, you can grab the subfolder inside, inside your Git repo and say, well, just, just build if this subfolder's changed. Um, but we didn't really want to go learn Concourse. We had enough to do, so we, we stuck with Jenkins. Jenkins works best when you make your changes at the top, so the top level changed, and there you go. So we went multi-repo, so every microservice has its own repo in GitHub. So the other thing we did is we wanted to automatically provision Elasticsearch in Kafka and the Cloud Foundry stuff. And so we created a DSL, uh, so it's in YAML, so, so that's how I got to talk here, you know. If it was JSON, they'd kick me out. <laughs> um, so, so we have it in YAML, and it's just simple stuff, like, you know, what's your app called? How much memory do you need? Uh, you know, what's your topic called? It's not all the options, so it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be everything you put in the manifest, for instance. It would just be a subset, because there's a lot of stuff that you don't really need to worry about, like, um, where the Kafka server is or where Elasticsearch, that, we'll take care of that as the pipeline. You just need to know you're gonna use Elasticsearch and you want your index to be called this and here's the JSON and such and such. And, and so what we would do as part of the pipeline is we would check to make sure that's okay. So you wanna know sooner, you don't wanna go all the way to deploy and say, like, oh hey, the thing failed because you had a syntax error. So we wanna know that as soon as possible. So we check that here. And then what we do is we put the, the artifacts in S3. Now we can argue all day as to the best artifact repository. Um, some people like Nexus, other people like Artifactory. We chose S3, partly for the reason that we had more control over that and we didn't have to uh, rely on other teams. So that's always good when you're trying to get stuff done in a hurry is to do stuff you have control over. 
The other bit uh, we did was, so part of our goal was that each deploy, each branch would get its own pipeline all the way through. So if I'm working on my branch, Reed, and my colleague's working on his branch, John, then you know, we'll, have, we'll, have a, we'll have a read space, and we'll have a read uh, Kafka topic, and we'll have a read Elastic Search Index, and so on and so forth. So I'll be able to deploy everything all the way out, and, and John will be able to do that as well, and we won't conflict with each other. So the nice thing of, of using S3 is we can put the buckets named after the branches, or named after whatever we're deploying. So we have a prod, prod bucket or whatnot, which makes it really easy for cleanup. So whenever we delete the branch, then we just delete the S3 bucket, and, and it makes life a lot simpler. And then, and then grand plans, which haven't quite been realized yet, I'll be honest, but the idea is to have a chatbot in between the CI and the CD. So when you're deploying to dev, or maybe staging, it's, it's great, you can just kick it off automatically. But especially at a bank, you'll want to hold off your prod deployment to have some sort of manual step. And that manual step will be someone saying, slash, chat, <laughs> slash pipeline bot, deploy. Right? So that, that's kind of how that'll work. All right, so that was the CI, so let's have a look at the CD. So what we did now is we created the environment parameters. So these are things like server locations, uh, API URLs, et cetera. And then we combine those with the application parameters to get our full, full picture. So you know, we know it's gonna be called Reads Awesome App, and, and we know it, it needs a large amount of memory, so we'll give it four gigs, and so on and so forth. So we get something that we can actually go off and deploy. And then we'll go and provision our Kafka topics, if they're not there, again, item potency, will create any elastic search indexes if needed. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. And then we'll do the actual deployment. So the idea is, is we're gonna do um, a blue-green deployment, so we wanna have uh, zero downtime as much as possible. So I, I can never remember which is which, but, but so we'll do the green first, uh, deploy that, and then, and then what we did this time is we did automated testing on the on the non-live route. So we have our temp route pointing to our, our new app. So we'll do the testing there, which is great, because now if, it, if the testing fails, we can just not switch the route over. And then if the testing does pass, then we will switch the route over. Um, so the idea is that this automated testing is something that the user will, the developers will provide. So they, their development team will plug something in there, and then it'll call whatever testing it needs to happen. And, and then we'll just check the, the return code, so either it's success or failure. And then, and then we'll finalize the deployment, so we'll make, we'll make the running app live. So, what, so, so the, this is a picture of what the developer experience looks like now that they have this pipeline. So all they have to do really is inherit from the parent palm, add a few parameters to say, you know, here's my app name, here's the memory, here's my Kafka topic, and that's it. And, and they commit and away they go. So I mean, this was so good that when we were developing it, we hadn't kind of finished everything, so we got like little bits done. And so we were working on the bits that weren't in the pipeline yet. And it was, it was so painful. So we were in a, in a little room of like four of us, and we were so painful, we all turned around like, oh, I wanna use the pipeline, because it's so good. So and that, at that point, that I knew that uh, we had something special. So thank you very much. That's, uh, that's it, that's it for the talk, thank you. We have time for a few questions. Anyone wants to grill me? Yeah, go ahead. What role exactly does Cloud Foundry play in the pipeline? What does Cloud Foundry do for us in the pipeline? So Cloud Foundry is just our deployment target. So we use that as a platform as a service where we run stuff. Does that, does that answer your question? Like, like it's the target where we deploy, where we deploy to. That's, that's a good question. So where we run Docker is still in flux. Um, so there's talk of running it there, there's talk of running it elsewhere. So. Yeah. So do we have to do what for artifacts in this? Sure, sure, so the question is, um, 
The question is, did we have to get approvals to store our data in S3? So the bit that's hidden in this wonderful green box is that it's an internal S3. So it's an S3 API on top of internal storage. So in that case, we didn't have to get approvals to put stuff outside onto public cloud. So that, this whole thing runs internally. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, so the question is how much work was this and was it frustrating and I felt like I should have, it should be available somewhere else. So the answer is probably too much work or not enough, I don't know. It felt like a lot of work at the time. The benefits are certainly there. I wish there was something that we could use straight out of the box and there are some efforts, um, shout out to Spring Cloud Pipelines. Uh, I know Marchin is doing a great job with that stuff. It didn't quite fit our use case. We'd, we'd kind of gone far enough down the road that we hadn't, weren't able to use it. Um, but it really depends on like how much control you want to give up. So, so if, if you want to do everything for your developers or as much as possible, then you end up writing stuff yourself. So no, nothing is going to end up creating you know, Kafka and Elasticsearch as well. So if you want to do just deploy to PCF, then that's okay. Um, so the idea that, that we want to do is on top of this is we'll add the security checks. We'll add whatever bits that are currently manual processes in here as automated checks. But if, if we use something out of the box, then is that availability, is that, is that feature available? So that's kind of the, the trade-off. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. How are you doing your blue-green deploy? Is that some custom or is it just a tooling deployment? Yeah, it's, um, we just end up calling different APIs at different points. But the, the idea is we do a CF push with a lot of the no options, so dash, dash, no, pretty much everything. <laughs> and then, um, then we'll assign a temp route to it, uh, which is really all we need. And then eventually we'll, we'll assign the real route to it, delete the temp route, and delete what the real route used to be pointing to. And then we'll clean up any applications that, that were there from failed deploys in the past. So it is, it is sadly a, a set of just like making a bunch of steps in the same way you'd pipe together a bunch of Unix commands, that's really the way we did it. Yeah, man. So the question is, how long did it take us to get there? Um, yeah, so probably about three months from, from the time we'd finished the second pipeline to here. And a lot of that, quite frankly, was spent deciding which direction we wanted to go. Like making decisions, I stand up here and say, oh, we're using multi-repo, you know, this is so easy. Uh, but, but getting to the point where we decide that that's the right thing we want to do, I'm like, oh, we want to do, we want to do Jenkins, and oh, we want to use the GitHub org plugin in, in, uh, in Jenkins, and oh, we want to use Docker. Like these sort of questions, and like how much control do we give to developers was really where we spent a lot of our time. The coding it up wasn't terribly important, or t terribly difficult. I mean, it, it still took time, but the hardest bit was kind of figuring out what we wanted to do. There you go. Yeah, so the question is, do we look at Concourse? Yeah, so um, there are kind of two parts of the cloud team at RBC. So there's the platform team, which runs Cloud Foundry and Kafka and Elasticsearch, and they use Concourse for that. Um, for the development side, we didn't have enough experience, and, and I played around with Concourse a bit, and one of the problems I found was that you have to build, and I don't know if it's better yet, so, so I don't want to insult anyone, but, but you have to build a lot of the things you get for free out of the box with Jenkins. Stuff like having a workspace that carries through all the way, like on all your Docker images, sorry, all your Docker containers. Uh, stuff like that you kind of get for free with Jenkins. And we had a ton of experience. Um, I think between us, there was something like 30 years of administering Jenkins. So we had a ton of familiarity. So it felt silly to throw that away when we had so many other questions to answer. Yeah, in the back, go ahead. So the chat, yeah, the chatbot. So the chatbot isn't implemented, so this is all kind of theoretical, but I will talk about how the chatbot works. So the idea is it is a PCF service, yeah, that would, that would talk to, in this case, Slack. And, um, and the idea is it would say, hey, your build's done. Um, and, then, and then, hey, your deploy's done, et cetera. And then for higher level environments, you, you would t ask it to deploy that application. That would be your interface. So instead of going to the UI in Jenkins and say, you know, click to deploy, you would go do through a chatbot. So that's the idea. 
Anyone else? Anyone? Awesome. All right. Thanks so much for uh, thanks so much for listening. Appreciate it.